It's hell, it's, okay, I am standing in for Andy Altman, the chief executive of the Olympic Park Legacy Company, who unfortunately has been unable to join us. Andy has been a member of the Urban Age since its inception uh, and uh, is now very involved in running one of probably Europe's largest uh, urban redevelopment project. Um, I've taken the liberty after consulting with uh, Wolfgang and others whether this was okay to effectively give his talk, uh, very aware that um, uh, otherwise LSE may be using too much airspace, uh, but uh, I think it's an important contribution because what I'm going to talk about or what he would have talked about is can an event like the London Olympics actually make a difference to the health of a city. Now yesterday we already with Stephen O'Brien uh, and Tony Travers began to talk about some of these issues, so I'm going to just use his presentation and add to that. And Marianne, you'll tell me how we're doing in terms of time. A lot of discussion happened yesterday in terms of understanding inequality in a city like London, and we talked a lot about the fact that East London has its own sort of set of problems in terms of downgraded uh, public housing, uh, a degree of lack of infrastructure, particularly in health, education, uh, and other services, and it's right in the middle of this area that uh, the Olympics is actually being built. In fact, this is a very, very recent picture, and you begin to see the main stadium already completed and some of the other facilities uh, happening. Uh, this is a view of the map of deprivation of London that we saw yesterday, showing how the darker colors concentrate social deprivation in the east. Uh, there's the River Thames with Canary Wharf that was referred to before over here and the site is this yellow site. We also talked yesterday, I presented the Charles Booth map, if you remember, of poverty in London from a century and a half ago, uh, what, sorry, 1890s, which show in the darker colors in exactly this area, there's the uh, Isle of Dogs and where Canary Wharf is today, show in the darker areas how deprivation was concentrated 120 years ago. We haven't improved very much in that space of time. Uh, and that's why, uh, many of us who have been involved in, in this field in London have focused on a redevelopment plan or future vision of the city to concentrate development along these axes to the east. That's where there's greater concentration of deprivation as you've seen. And this is something which has been in the sort of planning philosophy of London now for a number of years. We happen to have won the Olympics in uh, 2007 for next year. Uh, we didn't expect to. So we actually use the Olympics collectively, this is what Andy would have said, to kickstart a regeneration of all levels, including health of the area. Just to locate us, there's London. Uh, we're in, uh, on the east side of uh, the United Kingdom. Very strong connections as it happens by rail to what we still call the continent, otherwise known as Europe, um, and uh, therefore a corridor of accessibility which takes us eastwards uh, uh, through the Thames Valley, effectively. The whole idea here is to shift development, concentrate new opportunities eastwards uh, to rebalance the city, as I described yesterday. So this image, which is a very architectural image, is really trying to say what the project is about. How do you restitch together the social, economic, and health fabric of the city? So to use an event which only lasts for two weeks and has to be closed, because of security issues, uh, to actually make it something open and integrated. And that's what the master plan is really about. The bid document uh, from 2005 already said, and that's one of the reasons perhaps why London actually nearly got, uh, got in there, was to emphasize the fact that it should be an enduring legacy, that it should actually leave a mark and not do what Los Angeles or Atlanta or for that matter Athens did uh, to the local economy, i.e. leave hardly anything behind or large debt. Our model in London has been Barcelona. So the whole notion was to actually create a park with a series of facilities which I'll describe, um, building on what's there, very important, building on the DNA of the local area, building on the fact that it's in a massively well integrated place in terms of public transport anyway, not to mention the connections to Europe uh, and the continent and many of the communities that Tony Travers was describing yesterday in terms of immigrant communities, very different parts of the world and very many different generations. There's a lot there. We win the Olympics, 9.3 billion pounds of public money uh, comes to this area. The first chunk of it was used as very important in terms of health and other issues to get rid of 
the uh, high tension power which crisscrossed the site for the last 50, 60 years. You could never do that without that sort of upfront money which comes from the public sector. It's all been put underground, therefore you actually have a development footprint. You have a very large piece of land owned by the government and owned by Andy Altman, effectively. So the Olympic Park Legacy Company is a government agency which is a combination of the mayor and central government which effectively takes over <coughs> the ownership of this very, very large uh, piece of land. Now because of time, we won't go through it in detail, but just think of this as a large piece of city with a big, big and massive railway station and other connections right at the heart of it. A, ma a very beautiful park being created there, not just for the games, but for afterwards. And a whole series of venues actually being built across the site. A major stadium, of, uh, a, an aquatic center by the architect Zaha Hadid, uh, a, a velodrome, etc., etc. But you'll see many more venues, but only four remain. That's a very, very important concept. In other words, you use it as a temporary sort of notion. In fact, uh, what you see here, all these white platforms, are the bits of land which have been cleaned up, depolluted, and actually are ready for new development, not just offices and housing, but also other facilities that I'll come to. So the idea is that over time, something like 15, 20, 30 years, what might happen is that you restitch, you build up the facilities to create, to fill the gaps in those holes that I said. The most important thing, though, is not just filling the gaps within the site, and this is a key issue, if I think, of Richard Sennett's points yesterday about, about integration com and complexity. How do you connect back to the existing tissue, not just physical, but social, of all the communities that are around? And this is very much, I think, what the OPLC's uh, objectives, which you can see here, are. It's not just to create um, more development and more housing and to flog it off to developers. It's very much, as you can see here, to deliver social and economic and environmental benefits. And it's interesting to see that only a few uh, weeks ago, effectively, in September 2011, um, the notion that sport and healthy living should be very much part of the whole agenda of a development company of this sort is, is uh, quite interesting and, I think, important. So what does this look like and what are they doing in terms of making a difference to the health of the residents, both who will move in the area, but much more importantly in this wider uh, area of East London that we've d been describing. Well, first of all, the park in and of itself is an asset. The mere fact that there will be a new park of some quality, this is a picture taken when Tony Travers and I were there only a few weeks ago, this is what this park now looks like. It is incredibly high quality, I have to say, and it will be, of course, an asset for everyone who lives around there, not just the residents. And that's got to do with exactly the issue of grain, tissue and integration. If you can't get there, there's no point in having it. If this is behind a big wall, so to speak, or let's call it, referring to Carrie Lamb's presentation, around a vertical cluster <laughs> that you can't connect to, it wouldn't work in terms of what it's intended to do. So I think that's an issue for wider discussion. There will be some facilities like the velodrome, not just the park, which become a place where kids who live in the area will go cycling. I mean, basically, English kids don't do a lot of sport, I think, compared to others. They only win Olympics, apparently, on sitting down, rowing, on horseback, and on cycles. Uh, so, so it's quite interesting that that's um, actually what happens. So perhaps this will be building on that great natural asset that we have for sitting, uh, and even maybe do a bit more. This is the great swimming pool complex by Zaha Hadid. What is important about this is that if I live there in 10 years' time with small kids, they will be going swimming here. At the moment in East London, there's no swing pool at all. So that will make certainly a difference in terms of what might happen. There's an Olympic village which is being built and 50% more or less of this whole complex is what we call affordable housing. That's by law, it's not by uh, sort of uh, design. So that's an important element. And significantly, they're not placed in the bad bit of the site. Each one of these urban blocks has literally the mix within the block itself as opposed to across the site. So that's uh, significant, and that's why schools and health centers being placed at the middle of this project will be not just venues for the local uh, new inhabitants, but for the people who are there. So this is a sort of vision of what might happen in the next 20 or 30 years. Let me conclude with some of the points that Andy would have made, which are sort of important here, that this sits within a wider 
uh, context, and that's why hearing Carrie Lam, hearing Talk Chow is so important, which is political. Uh, Tony knows that there is a sort of probably rare moment where the national government and local government are trying to work together in terms of convergence of these sort of big ideas that you see here. Uh, and the convergence themes are around the notion of creating wealth and reducing poverty, very important, supporting healthier lifestyles. So that's in the sort of political DNA of the people running London and central government and developing successful neighborhoods. So just in those three, you see an integration between the physical and the social at the heart, in many ways, of the project. We don't have time to go through this, but I think it's interesting to see that what the OPLC is doing is actually, uh, if you look at some of these points, give children the best start in life, reduce the number of people dying prematurely, uh, reduce the number of people's health affects their ability to work, et cetera, et cetera, is a series of ambitions and goals uh, which are there. I'm going to do three more slides and then stop. Um, it's Andy's fault if I'm going too long. I know it's, uh, um, what is it that's being done apart from the physical infrastructure that I've described? Well, there are a lot of sports clubs and people who are being trained through the Olympic project and a lot of the promotion that comes in with the sponsorship to become coaches and everything who are living in the area and going to work in the area. And therefore, they will stay in the area. And I think that will make a difference. They're the sports facilities that I've already described, but not just in the site, but everywhere else. And again, that will probably make a difference. So Andy would have concluded, uh, can the London Olympics make East London healthier? The answer is yes, would say that. And how do you measure it? And I thought this was interesting. If we go back to some of the points that were being made yesterday, some of the statistics that uh, even we at uh, LSC Cities and HKU began to look at here, if you take these parameters, male life expectancy, female life expectancy, development of a child age uh, five, mortality rates, etc., just in the five years since the beginning of this project happened, uh, there's already an increase, apparently, or improvement in terms of male life expectancy, obesity level for children, mortality rates from circulatory diseases for people under 75, and there's still a lot of work uh, to go in terms of female life expectancy uh, and others. But probably most importantly is that physical activity in this very deprived part of London where obesity is high has already improved in these five years. So in a sense, this is a project which is really trying to change the way, not just how London is designed, but how people's behaviors are actually structured. Thank you very much.